So I'm, I'm leaving them behind and using my other device. All right, well, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone. It's great to have everybody on this call and great to have a, a Java with Giles after all these months. So, Yay! Uh, yeah, yeah, no kidding. Um, Mayor, we have a sponsor this morning, um, our friends at Friendly Auto. So I'm gonna turn it over to them for just a couple of minutes and then we'll get started. Perfect. Steve and Felicia. Hi. There she is. Good morning. I'm Steve Rosansky. I'm the owner of Friendly Auto Centers in lovely Mesa, Maine and Higley, uh, serving the automotive industry for 43 years. We've been here six years in Mesa. We're the number one shop rated by AAA. Uh, it'll be three years in a row. We are looking to win our third year in a row, best shop in Phoenix by AAA. We have just been nominated for the BBB Torch of Ethics Award. And we just won second the year second year in a row. And we just uh, were awarded the Carfax Shop of the Year um, mm. in Phoenix. Oh. So a lot of good stuff going on. We have 22 service bays. And um, we deal with mostly local businesses. So the money stays in Mesa, stays in Arizona. Um, we're not a franchise. We're strictly, you know, one shop, one owner. I don't look to open up more shops. Um, I'm also, me and my wife are the host of Drive Friendly Radio Show, which is Saturday mornings at 1580 The Fanatic Sports Radio. Uh, I've been doing radio for a little better than 20 years, so now we uh, took it out here. So we have a pretty popular show on Saturday mornings. Many of you have been guests on the show, and uh, it's a lot of fun. So tune in on Saturday mornings. What time? 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. Facebook, uh, Facebook and we also do party. Facebook uh, watch parties and live, and it's all over the place. So. Um, we like to tell everybody, drive friendly. Don't drive aggressive. Drive friendly. We have these cool bumper stickers and handouts and uh, stuff like that. And if you ever need anything for your car, uh, please come and see us. We offer a lifetime parts and labor warranty on everything we do. So you only pay once for auto repairs. I think that's it, right? And we sponsor local charities, one oh, of yeah. them being our great friend, Liz Paulus. Oh, College Down Bound. over there on College Bound. She's going to be a guest on our radio show this week. We're going to talk about the gala coming up for the non-gala fundraiser. Yes, virtual so, fundraiser. Virtual so fundraiser. Fun. And we give a lot of back. We give a lot back to our community. We've had water drives, food drives, clothing drives, uh, pretty much every kind of drive you could imagine. So, drive friendly. Drive friendly. <laughs> so now we'll turn it over to who? To Mayor Giles. Uh, Sally. To we'll Sally. I'm Mayor. sorry. Back to oh, Sally. Okay, I'll take it. Hey, Later. Mayor. We just want to say, obviously, congratulations on wow, your reelection. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great background. For you. I yes, we voted yes, it is a great background. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's very excited. So um, we're going to turn it over to you for some updates. What's going on in Mesa? Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, Sa Sally's heard me say this a, a bunch of times, so she's going to try not to uh, to cry. But there's a couple of things you need to know me about me right off. Is that number one, I'm I'm a politician. Obviously, I was just my my name was plastered all over the streets for the last you know several weeks, and I can't uh you know persuasively convince anybody to the contrary that i'm not a politician and then number two is before that for 25 years i, I practiced law as an attorney so the, the the combination of those two things have created in me a highly developed ability to be extremely boring so in order to overcome that it's important that that you uh that this be a, a, di a dialogue rather than a monologue so, so please, uh, hopefully you'll, you'll interrupt me and you'll raise your hand or, or you'll, uh, you'll just interject, well, you know, what about this or what about that, you know, because uh, I'm anxious to, to chat about the, the issues that are on your mind uh, relative to the city of Mesa. Uh, but I'll just kind of uh, kick it off by, by saying, the, saying the obvious, which is we're obviously living in very interesting times right now and, and uh, going through the, the, the COVID-19 uh, experience, you know, I, I think it's been uh, uh, monumental for all of us uh, in, in, in just many, many ways. And uh, I, occasionally I try to reflect on that and, you know, and, and ask myself, what are, the, what are the lessons that I'm supposed to be learning, you know, as a result of this experience? And uh, there are some things I think that have been made more obvious to me about uh, our community and about uh, you know, what, what uh, I as a member of that community maybe ought to be doing to try to, uh, to make things better for, for those that I, uh, that I live with. And um, a couple of the, some of these observations, uh, I don't know, coincidentally, but they, they, they've kind of uh, dawned on me as I've participated in uh, some of the food distribution events that we've had in our city. 
uh, I'm, I'm proud of the way that uh, our community has really rallied around each other and, and stepped up uh, in multiple ways. But, but one of the, uh, at the beginning of this uh, experience, one of the things the city of Mesa tried to do early on was, was to, to reach out to as many people as we could to do some, uh, just a big community engagement event to ask people, what are the needs of the city? You know, what should we be focusing the resources of the city on uh, that would be, you know, have the most impact uh, to the most people? And you may recall at the, at the very beginning of this experience, we were all, uh, I mean, the, the first thing that happened is our grocery store shelves emptied. You know, people uh, uh, kind of hunkered down and, and uh, went out and bought all the toilet paper they could, uh, you know, fit in their car and, uh, and and so back in, in that environment, when we were asking people, what are you worried about? The, the, the first thing that came back was food insecurity. Uh, and so as a result of that, uh, you know, we immediately tried to, to respond and, and, and the city of Mesa uh, really jumped in a strong way into partnerships with our food banks, uh, United Food Bank in a, in a big way, but also Midwest Food Bank and a lot of the food pantries and, and other uh, you know, folks that were engaged in, in food and addressing food insecurity. And so uh, I recall that the, that the very first, one of those very first events, uh, I was uh, there to volunteer and, and, and uh, as I was, was helping, I, I, I very quickly became concerned with the fact that, uh, that there was just a long, this was before we figured out how to do this and, and allow people to remain in their cars. Uh, but there was a long line of, of senior citizens that were standing next to each other, literally wrapping around the building, uh, many of them wearing face masks. And this was back before everybody wore face masks. Uh, and I could tell that, 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 that they were not only elderly, but they also had underlying medical conditions. Uh, and um, obviously, these were the people that we did not want, you know, standing in line to, to get food. And I thought, how how tragic that they are that they're so uh, concerned about food that they're willing to that, you know to put their lives on the line to come out and and uh and address that need uh and uh so it just brought home to me in a in a powerful way that, that we have a real divide uh there, there's a, a disconnected population of seniors who who didn't have uh you know a church group or or grandchildren or uh, neighbors that had, you know, taken them under their wing, uh, they were kind of on their own, you know, to, to, to figure out how to address that, uh, that challenge. Uh, and so as a result of that, we, uh, we, we rallied with, uh, you know, some of the, the do-gooders in our community and, and had this uh, adopted grandparent program that I think is, that has been effective uh, in, in helping folks in that situation. So, so that's one divide in our community that I think we need to figure out how to, uh, even after the, the COVID challenge has been resolved, we need to, that's been made more obvious to me and we need to build bridges uh, between the, 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 the generational divide, but also the kind of the tale of two cities that we have going on in Mesa, where we have the haves and the have nots. And uh, one of the things I love about Mesa is it's a great combination of people who, uh, who need help and people who have the resources and the inclination and the sense of calling, you know, to step up and, and, and help people. Uh, it's, so I, I wouldn't want to live uh, anywhere else because, uh, you know, that, that, that's great that we have those two things going on at the same time. Uh, another similar experience that uh, occurred to me uh, during a, uh, one of these food distribution events is just the, is the digital divide that, that it, it is, is prevalent in our community. Uh, I was at a, an elementary school, you know, Mesa Public Schools has been a great source of providing food to, the, to people in our community throughout this process as well. They, they've got, you know, uh, drive up facilities uh, and a lot of school, all the, all the kids that are on free and reduced lunch, you know, throughout this process and, and even not, not just those kids, but everybody could come to public schools and get food. And I was at one of these events. It happened to be at an elementary school where my, my son-in-law is the principal in, in uh, a neighborhood that has, you know, almost exclusively free and reduced lunch students. And as uh, the families would, would drive up uh, to get their food, uh, they also uh, 
were, were adamant about picking up packets uh, for their kids to work on, on their schoolwork. Uh, and that's because a lot of these families didn't have you know, access to the internet. Uh, you know, the curriculum had, had been, had shifted over to a, 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 you know, an online curriculum. Uh, and so most of the, you know, the, if, if you had the ability, if you had laptops or, uh, or smartphones, you know, you, your kids were, were sitting down at the kitchen table doing their schoolwork. But for, uh, you know, a lot of the families, particularly at this, uh, this, uh, this particular elementary school, they were there for the food, but more, you know, just as importantly, you know, they were willing to pull over and park and wait for, for 10 minutes uh, to get, pick up a packet, you know, for a third grade kid um, because uh, they were anxious for their kids to be able to continue to, to receive their education. So the, the, the copy machines inside this little elementary school were just, you know, working 24 hours a day, kicking out uh, third and fourth and fifth grade packets, you know, for these families to, to continue their kids' education. Um, and so um, we have a, a digital divide in our community. Uh, there are, the, and I think e e even those of us who are uh, somewhat affluent, you know, and have working internet in our homes, I think many of us have, have, have discovered over the last few weeks that when you've got uh, you know, uh, adults, maybe more than one adult in, in a home that's working remotely. And then you combine that with one or two kids that uh, are going to school remotely. Uh, I mean, your, your, your bandwidth is not capable of handling that. And uh, so, uh, so that, that, that's an infrastructure challenge uh, in our community that, again, has been made very clear to me as a result of the pandemic. So, uh, going for my one on, on my list of lessons learned from COVID is that we need to uh, be better at providing uh, infrastructure in our community uh, so that we can have what I'm calling ubiquitous Wi-Fi you know everywhere uh, in Mesa we want you to be able to, to have um, access to, to high-speed internet uh, we want to have fiber in uh, up and down the streets of our city so that whether you're you live in a affluent neighborhood or a less than affluent neighborhood you know uh, the, the, the your, your devices are going to work uh, and your kids are going to be able to go to school and you're going to be able to have you know two or three devices going on in, in a house and and in function uh, I, I think uh, people even you know four or five years ago when people talked about uh, Wi-Fi and bandwidth, you know, being a, an essential utility, uh, some of us kind of rolled our eyes and, and thought, well, that's, you, you may be taking that a little too far. You know, it's not the equivalent of uh, water and, and, and air conditioning and, you know, some of the essential services that we rely on and, and, or that we think of utilities. But uh, I've, I've come to the conclusion that it is. Uh, in order for, for families and individuals to, to mean, have a meaningful you know, opportunity to be successful in life, but we need to consider uh, access to that technology as a utility. So uh, I'm, I'm interested in, in hearing your, your thoughts on that because uh, in, in order for us to go forward with, with, with uh, addressing that in a meaningful way, you know, we're, we're gonna have to, to dedicate some, some serious city resources to uh, extending uh, more conduit throughout our neighborhood. Conduit are you know, the pipes that you put in streets uh, that then the, the technology companies can, can uh, uh, put their fiber cables through that and, and get that out to all the neighborhoods and all the businesses in our community. Uh, that's, I, I think, a very legitimate role for, for city government to play. We've done it to a large extent, but like I said, I've, I've come to the conclusion, many of us, our city manager included, have come to the conclusion that we can can do a better job of that. Uh, you guys are doing a really bad job of stopping me and asking me questions and doing a dialogue. So I'm just going to keep talking until you, you know, stick you stick your finger, uh, one of your fingers up at me and, and ask a question. Yes, Bob. So I did actually ask everybody to kind of post those questions in the chat so that we oh, can okay. relay I'm them sorry. to you. There we go. So I do have a couple of questions for you. Um, the okay. first question is actually not specific for you, but I think it's a good segue for you to talk about a specific program. Uh, it's a question about the small business assistance program. Uh, the question was whether or not someone could apply for the 
assistance in the second phase if they had received money through the first phase. Uh, and I know that they can, but I thought I might open it up to you to, to talk just briefly about that. Thank you. Perfect uh, softball. I appreciate it. Uh, the, back to that, uh, the community outreach thing that I talked about earlier, you know, right after food insecurity, you know, closely following was, was economic security, particularly for small business people and particularly for the small business people that maybe didn't qualify for, for some of the federal assistance, the PPP and the SBA loans and things like that. So that's when we, we launched this uh, small business uh, assistance program as part of the Mesa Cares uh, uh, initiative. Uh, and the first round of that was, was you know, grants for, for people uh, and to, to help them, it's small businesses that hadn't previously qualified with, with uh, rent and utilities. And, and uh, I'm glad, it's happy to say we passed out about 500 checks to 500 different businesses for that. But then the, the, the next part of that is this, again, technical assistance program. Technical assistance, uh, <clears throat> frankly, I think is going to have a, a bigger impact uh, on the business than, than you know, the, the checks that we passed out. Uh, and so between the, the Mace Chamber of Commerce, uh, the DMA, uh, Benedictine University, CAHOOTS, you know, there, there's a lot of great organizations that have come together that, that are great at, at uh, helping small businesses uh, negotiate, you know, the, the, the complex world we live in and, you know, how to have a presence online, how to, you know, just a lot of nuts and bolts, uh, pra practical uh, assistance in, in how to function and how to have a business uh, that, uh, that it is extremely, extremely valuable. I know I, I started my own, uh, I left and started my own law practice back in, I think, 1995. And, and I thought I was fairly well prepared as an attorney to do that. You know, I'd been practicing for several years and, and knew how to do the work, but I was wholly un unprepared to be a small business person, you know, and to know how to, how to function and how to, to in that environment. So, um, so, the, so, but, so to answer Bob's question, uh, the, yes, uh, whether or not you were uh, participating in, in the first round, you know, getting those grants for, for uh, um, rent and utilities, totally separate from that, please do apply for uh, the, the technical assistance program and, and you won't be denied. I mean, we, we don't uh, say no to people for that. Uh, and uh, we're anxious for, for everyone to participate in that. Uh, well, I had a great experience a, a week ago, I was at uh, Dixon's Jewelers in downtown Mesa and we, uh, they were one of the recipients of uh, one of those big checks. And, uh, and Michelle there said, this is great, but I got to tell you a story. We, we signed up for the technical assistance program and I went online and, and took a class on how to improve my, uh, my Google search, you know, uh, responses for my business. And uh, we were dramatically better, you know, after that, you know, I, I didn't realize how much I didn't know about how to be good at that. And, and last, and, and then just a couple of days later, a gentleman came in on, on a Saturday and spent like $2,800, you know, uh, between getting, the, you know, a few things fixed and buying this and that. And 100%, this guy came in because I'd, I'd gone through that Google class. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I please do uh, help. Uh, please look at it, sign up for it, spread the word that there's a lot of really great resources that are part of that technical assistance program that, that unquestionably will have an impact in improving your business. So that was kind uh, of a hard sell. So next, uh, next question. Yes. Uh, talk a little bit about the recent Amazon announcement and some of the economic impact that that'll have on Mesa. Sure. Uh, right uh, immediately to the east of Boeing, uh, is that Higley? Uh, there, there's a, a huge building uh, that, that was, it's a spec building that was built uh, by Opus. Uh, I think it's, you know, like 60, 70,000 square feet. Uh, you know, it casts its, you know, a shadow, you know, all over town. And, uh, and that building, uh, building those types of buildings is, is really smart right now in the city of Mesa because uh, our economic development people will tell you that we constantly have huge businesses like Amazon that are coming to Mesa and saying, hey, we need a 100,000 square foot building, you know, and we need it tomorrow. Uh, and so the, the, the smart people that are re developing real estate are, are building these kind of buildings. So, so that building has been, uh, is, you know, is turnkey ready, you know, for uh, someone like Amazon to come in and, and uh, bring, you know, hundreds of jobs and 
and uh, use, utilize uh, 80,000 square feet of, of, of building. So uh, Amazon uh, has, uh, was, was looking, you know, they're, they're, they're uh, buying, kind of gearing up in, in the Phoenix area in a big way. And so uh, they have these big Amazon, you know, fulfillment centers that are literally like a million square feet, you know, uh, they have their own environment inside, it's just amazing. Uh, and then that the, they have the last mile uh, facilities that are still gigantic, and that's where a lot of people work. That's where the you know the actual uh, vehicles that make the deliveries to your home come in and, and get and the orders are put in, and it's like a huge postal uh, operation. And and that's what that building is going to become. It's going to be the last mile, you know, where where the trucks actually get the stuff put in their truck to get to your house. Um, and so uh, and 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 it. The building itself, you know, like I say, is huge right now, but they're adding to it because this is where a lot of people are actually going to come to work. You know, a lot of the, the, the a lot of cars are going to be parked there. A lot of the vehicles that deliver the the your orders to your home, you know, are going to come through there. So it's going to be a very busy place, uh, and it's going to have. Uh, I mean, we've all become used to e-commerce as uh, you know uh, as part of our daily lives, right? I mean, and and hopefully as small business people. We've learned to uh, to adapt to that, and and uh, because it's probably been it had a, a not had a, not a good impact on a lot of small businesses in Mesa, but those of us that, that you, have realized that e-commerce is here to stay, you know, hopefully maybe we're taking advantage of that. So uh, it's it's a big deal. Uh, Amazon is moving uh, ahead fast and furious, but the, the building is is already constructed. So it, it's going to happen very quickly, and Amazon is just moving in and, and uh, making it functional. So uh, real quick, I'll just remind everybody, if you do have a question, please don't hesitate to post it in the chat, and either Sally or myself will relay it for you. Um, next question. Uh, wondering if you have any insight as to... <laughs> Sorry. The suspense is building, isn't it? I think he's uh, he's reading a question about insight on um, snowbirds coming back. Oh, boy, we sure hope they're coming, right? I mean, that's when uh, that's uh, we're, we're all anxious uh, about that. Well, here, the, here's my my crystal ball projection on snowbirds. Uh, typically, you know, for the last million years, you know, we've kind of had uh, kind of a, a economic. Uh, uh, cycle that we've gone through in Mesa, where, you know, during the summertime, things kind of get real slow because everybody leaves town. You know, uh, we refer to February as, as Christmas in February, in, in March, well, Christmas in March is spring training, right, because the whole world comes to Mesa uh, for baseball and because it's the perfect weather. So, uh, and, 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 and so we, we usually get our, our sales tax in the month of March is just about the same as it is in December. You know, because that's just the cycles that we have here in Mesa as far as economic activity goes between snowbirds and, and baseball fans. Uh, and uh, we just kind of hang on and try to survive during the summer. Uh, well, we, we've we been very nervous and Mesa is very reliant on sales tax dollars. Uh, we're the largest city in the United States that does not have a primary property tax. So that's just, we've kind of got a, a different model for how things get, how we, we collect taxes around here very dependent on sales tax. So we were extremely nervous, you know, for the, the economic downturn, you know, the kind of the one, two punch of going into the summer months and, you know, uh, people being out of work and not having money and, and uh, not buying stuff as a result of, uh, you know, of, of that. Well, uh, come to find out uh, our, our sales tax for, for June and July are higher than they were last year. Uh, and we're going, what the heck is going on here? We thought we were in the middle of a, a, an economic downturn. Uh, and so I don't know why that is. Here, my, my guess is I think you know, a lot of people who, be, because we're kind of in a quarantine scenario, a lot of people, they're, you know, they're not getting in their cars and, and uh, going to visit their family in the state of Washington or going to San Diego for the weekend or you know, driving back east. Uh, uh, you know, travel is down, tourism is down, uh, not just people coming to Mesa, but people leaving Mesa. Uh, so uh, I, I, I suspect we will, but I mean, it is, 
the winter is still going to be horrendous, right? I mean, everybody who lives in, in uh, Chicago and in Wisconsin, you know, they're still going to be buried under three feet of snow. And I think a lot of them will say, well, we, we might as well, you know, be in Arizona, you know, fighting COVID there than, than, than snowed under here. So um, we don't, we just don't know what's going to happen. Uh, it might be that people are, are uh, intimidated by the virus and they're staying home because they're hunkering down or not. <laughs> I, I just don't know what's going to happen. But, but this summer, surprisingly, uh, sales tax has been better than it's ever been. That's good. Do you have any updates on spring training? No. Uh, I mean, it's been fascinating to watch, you know, the way that uh, baseball, base, they're playing baseball right now, right? And they're, they're playing it under uh, uh, very controlled situations uh, without fans. And, and, and so let's assume that they're going to try to do that, that, that the COVID situation doesn't get better, you know, that, that a, a, a vaccine, you know, doesn't, it doesn't come in and just be the holy grail that solves all our problems. Well, then that means that they might just try to follow the same model next year, but they're still going to need spring training, you know, to get ready for playing baseball. So um, I, I think maybe worst case scenario is we still have spring training, but we don't have fans, right? We, we follow the model that they're doing now, which, which would have some impact, but not, that's, not, that's not what we want. We want a lot of people in, in, you know, buying uh, hot dogs and beers and, and uh, Cubs hats and and paying the whole cams for parking, you know, that's, that's how, that's the regular model. Uh, but if you look at the NBA, you look at the Major League Baseball, um, uh, it'll be interesting to see how the NFL, you know, handles this, right? Um, the, the end, that I, I guess that's a long-winded way of saying I don't know, but I think uh, professional sports is still happening. And they're, uh, it, it's such a huge business, you know, people, it's, it's billions or trillions of dollars. So people just don't, uh, they're not willing to just shrug their shoulders and say, no, I guess we're not going to play baseball. Uh, next question. Uh, are there any other plans uh, for federal CARES dollars? Are there any other programs in the pipeline or things that are kind of coming down before the end of the year? Great, another great question. Uh, the, the current, um, just to remind you what you may already know, uh, back in, um, I think it was early April, the federal government put $90 million into the city of Mesa's checking account. And uh, the, the rules, and, and that's been a great blessing, at, at, at the same time, a great challenge, you know, for us to, to figure out uh, appropriately what to do with that money. There certainly are, you know, there's a million strings attached to that money. Uh, and so, uh, I th but I think we've, I'm really very proud of the way that we have uh, been stewards of that money and, and uh, got it into quickly into the hands of people that needed it. Um, but that money, some of the strings that are attached to that money is, you know, it's, it's like Cinderella, you know, on the midnight on the 31st of December, you know, the golden slippers uh, the disappear, you know, we, we, that, that, that evaporates. We can't spend any of that money after, after December 31st. Now the problem is, uh, it wouldn't it be nice if we knew that COVID was over on December 31st. It's, but it's not going to be. Uh, so we're going to have all the same challenges uh, without federal assistance. So that's why uh, Congress has been. Uh, they understand that, and they've been, you know, in the midst of wrestling with this issue for a few months. A couple of months ago, the Democrats in the House of Representatives passed uh, legislation called the Heroes Act that authorized three trillion dollars you know of, of additional COVID relief and uh, a couple hundred billion dollars of that three trillion dollars was to go to state and local governments uh, in, in it's similar to the the funds that you know the first round of funds that we got in April. Uh, the Senate uh, has not done anything and so uh, you know, uh, so it doesn't do any good for the House to do something and the Senate not to. Uh, so it was about two weeks ago, you know, we were very, very close to the Senate and the House, you know, coming together and, and compromising, you know, it, the House was at one trillion, the Senate was at, I mean, not, the House was at three trillion, the Senate was at what, one trillion. So you're like, come on, you guys, uh, obviously, you just settle on two trillion, let's move on and, and help people. But uh, that didn't happen. Uh, 
I don't know, uh, everyone seems to think that Mitch McConnell and everyone says, yes, there needs to be more assistance. We're going to do it. Uh, it so it's, the answer seems to be that in, in, inevitably it's going to happen, but it's, it's stuck in, in the political machine right now. Um, and most people agree that, that state and local government assistance is going to be a part of that, but it's still, it's a negotiating, you know, uh, item right now. Okay, uh, next question. Any guidance in regards to self quarantine for uh, visitors that come into Mesa? So there was a, specifically the question was asking if snowbirds are gonna have to quarantine for 14 days when they come into town, so. Uh, yes, that, you know, that's, that's yet to be determined, right? We have seen that, I mean, Arizona, as you know, was, was the victim of, uh, of that, you know, uh, just a, a month or so ago, uh, when when people from Arizona would go to New York, they would they were told, you have to you know stay in your room for two weeks and you can't go out and interact with New Yorkers. Uh, so we, we have seen some of that happening. Uh, right now, uh, so I so I would hesitate to speak authoritatively saying that is or isn't going to happen. Uh, it seems like we've got hot spots, you know, that are popping up uh, all over the country, and 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 some states uh, have have adopted those kinds of, of rules. And Arizona, Governor Ducey has not done that to this point. You know, even when 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 New York was red hot and Arizona was cold, we we didn't have a quarantine in place rule. So that would be a departure, you know, uh, from the way the state has has handled it in the past. Uh, but I, I couldn't tell you unequivocally that's not going to happen, but I, I would guess that it's not. Okay. Uh, next question. Is the city of Mesa working with the Arizona Coyotes to obtain a more permanent location for their new stadium? Wow. Uh, <laughs> Left field? No, not at all. I mean, I, I know that, that there's newspaper reporters that are they're sniffing around asking this question, uh, so I don't know if any of them are on the on the call right now. <laughs> Um, uh, the, the Coyotes have uh, reached out to the city of Mesa uh, to, to, to look, you know, to explore uh, uh, options for a place to go. I think, you know, the, the, the city of Glendale built them an arena several years ago, and, and there's been a lot of, uh, you know, agreement and disagreement, you know, as to how, whether or not that's a good location and what the long-term, you know, home of the Coyotes is going to be. Uh, and there's been, uh, for a while, they had a spot in Tempe, you know, where uh, ASU was going to be a party of, to it as well. But um, I don't think there's sentiment in the political sentiment uh, in the, or support in the city of Mesa uh, for the city being a financial partner and building some sort of a, of a stadium for, for them. Uh, Mesa has, we have a provision in our city charter that requires that any time we build a, a sports related facility that has to be voter approved. So there's a lot of hoops that would have to be jumped through before the city of Mesa were, uh, had any kind of a role, you know, in, in owning or contributing to a, a facility uh, for, uh, to be used as a, as a stadium. Now, that being said, I think uh, it would be, so I'll, I'll tell you exactly what I told the, the, uh, the coyotes. Uh, I think you ought to look at places in, in the East Valley because I think that's where your fans are. Uh, and there's a few, you know, uh, wonderful sites, you know, at the intersection of some major freeways uh, that I think would make fabulous uh, locations for something like that. Uh, and so uh, please do, you know, go spend a gazillion dollars and build a beautiful stadium. I think that'd be great. Um, but uh, as far as it, uh, you know, the city of Mesa playing a role in, in, in subsidizing that, uh, I think I, you know, I wouldn't put any money on that. Excellent. Uh, next question. Uh, can you share what you know about what Mesa Public Schools is doing to get children back on campus as soon as possible? Uh, yes. Um, Boy, I'm sure glad I'm not on the Mesa School Board right now. <laughs> it's it's been uh, it's been uh, I, I have a uh, in, in spite of being 60 years old, I have a 16-year-old son who is a junior at Mountain View High School, 
And so, you know, we have skin in this game. This is uh, an issue that has uh, impact on, on my family. Uh, in addition to that, I have eight grandchildren, five of whom are enrolled in Mesa Public Schools. And on any given day, uh, my wife is the principal of the Giles Elementary School. And we have, you know, uh, grandkids scattered around the house on their laptops, you know, going to school. So, so this is what we talk about at my house. Um, and, and I have been uh, following uh, the Mesa School Board meetings on this topic for the last couple of weeks. And I have a, a lot of admiration for our, our, our school board members and our, and our, uh, our administrators because they have really been wrestling with this issue uh, mightily. Um, and where we're at right now is, uh, you know, there, there's a, a push and a pull, a push and a, and a tug here. You, people are concerned about uh, going back uh, early and exposing particularly, you know, the, the, the school teachers and the, and the adult staff, you know, to the spread of the virus. I think the, the consensus is that the kids are more resilient than adults, you know, to the virus, uh, but kids can spread the virus. Uh, so the question is, do you, ex you know, potentially put, uh, you know, the, the 60 year old uh, kindergarten teacher at risk, you know, by, by uh, asking her to go back into the classroom? Uh, the other, the tug on the other hand is that our kids need to be back in school, you know, for their own mental and emotional health, you know, uh, they're, they're, it's not good for them to be in, you know, quarantined at home. They, we, we need, uh, it, it's in everyone's best interest to have the kids back in school for, for all of those social and emotional issues, uh, let, let alone academic progress. Uh, so we're, they're, they're trying to strike a balance there. How, how can you, and maybe it's a hybrid, you know, maybe the kids come back two days a week and they're home three days a week or, uh, and that's, you're seeing some of that going on in some of the surrounding school districts. Uh, I, I should say that the city of Mesa has, has four school districts, uh, K-12 school districts, you know, in addition, Mesa Public Schools is, is most of it. Mesa Public Schools is the largest school district in the state, 65,000 kids, you know, that's, that's huge. But one third of Gilbert Public Schools lives in Mesa, Arizona, and uh, Queen Creek Public Schools. All of the Eastmark, Cadence, you know, southeast part of Mesa, the brand new Eastmark High School, that's all 100% in Mesa. But it's it's Queen Creek Public Schools, and then there's a portion of Higley Public Schools that's in Mesa as well. So uh, when I uh, I need to remember when I'm talking to schools that I need to call you know four different school superintendents to to, to really have a the right conversation. Uh, but to answer your question, uh, the, the latest, uh, as I understand it, and my wife could give you the details more than I, is that um, the, the school board uh, has announced that they are, uh, it, what the city, what the Mesa Public Schools has said is once we make the decision to go back, it's going to take us two weeks to, to, to make that happen, you know, for the teachers to get everything ready for the classroom doors to be open and for kids to be back in, in desks. So they've said we're, we're, they're shooting for the middle of September now for that to happen. Uh, and so they've, they've started the, you know, the let's get the, the classrooms ready for the kids to come back. Uh, but there are some benchmarks that the county health department has issued saying before schools should go back, they should be at, at these levels, you know, of, of, uh, of attainment for positive test results. And so, uh, I'm encouraging everyone to go get tested for COVID right now, uh, whether you have symptoms or not, you know, especially if you don't have 40 to 50% of the people that are walking around with COVID right now don't know it because they're either pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic. Uh, and so for us to have, uh, to get ahead of this thing, you know, we've got to, uh, we've got to stop thinking that, oh, I, I shouldn't tax the, the medical, you know, uh, system by going in and getting tested because I, I don't think I have it. Everybody needs to go get tested. And then probably two weeks later, you need to go get tested again. And two weeks after that, you need to go get tested again. Because that's how, uh, you know, uh, countries and cities and states get ahead of this thing uh, is by finding out who has it. And then you can self quarantine or we can do the contract contact tracing, you know, and, and you can put out an email and say, hey, I, I'm sorry, I went to your birthday party yesterday. I just, you know, tested positive for COVID today. And, and, and we can, you know, we can start corralling each other and, and preventing the spread of the virus. So, um, so to answer, I'm sorry, again, a long-winded answer to your question, but uh, it, Mace Public Schools has announced that they've, they've started the, the process of preparing to have kids come back on campus uh, 
please, uh, if, if you're a parent of a Mesa Public Schools student, you know, uh, as I am, you get, it seems like a, an email and a phone call every day, you know, with, with the latest update as to, to what to expect. But uh, everyone is working very hard because we all understand that kids need to be back in school uh, for their own, uh, for academic reasons, but also just for social and emotional reasons. Mayor, could you comment on a couple of things? Could you comment on um, first the um, transportation bond that's coming up and then also just what's happening with our homeless? Sure. Uh, thank you, Sally. Uh, you, you may have noticed on, on the street corners now there's a yes on question one signs that are popping up. Question one is a transportation bond. It's a, a $100 million bond to build uh, and, 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 uh, and rehab streets in the city of Mesa. Uh, if, if, particularly if you live in the southeast part of Mesa, uh, you're, you're, you're seeing uh, congestion on our streets. They're, they're not, uh, they don't have the capacity that they should and we need to build some new streets out there. Uh, now, we, we debated whether to put this on the ballot because, you know, again, we're in, we're in a economic downturn, people might not be uh, generous in thinking, yeah, let's, it, it now's the right time to go build some new streets. But uh, by, by uh, asking the voters for $100 million, we get $160 million because there's this thing called Prop 400 that, that is the regional uh, half cent sales tax that we all pay that puts money into a kitty, you know, that's shared regionally. And if we and, and the way we access that money is by matching some funds, and so uh, the, whether this is a strategic time. Some some communities are not being particularly aggressive right now in in uh, maintaining and building streets, and so we've, there's some money that's sitting there that we can access uh, if we if we want. So the the message on on this hundred million dollar bond is. Uh, we get $160 million if we spend $100 million. Uh, and, and there are parts of Mesa that uh, we've got some, some aging infrastructure. There are some of the, the big uh, intersections that you go through. You might notice your, your tires rumble a little bit because we've got some potholes and things aren't quite you know, worn out. And then if you live in Southeast Mesa or, or you drive between Mesa and Queen Creek or did Scott the Gateway Airport, you'll notice that, the, that uh, we're behind in uh, growth. We need to catch up to the growth that's, that's occurred out there. So um, it's a smart idea to, to vote for yes on question one. Uh, and the other issue that Sally asked about is homelessness. Uh, before COVID hit, I think we were all uh, realizing, oh my gosh, we, we have a, uh, an escalating homeless situation in the city of Mesa. Uh, and it's, it's a regional problem. You know, the city of Phoenix uh, has been struggling with it mightily for uh, several years and, and they've borne the brunt of it. And, uh, you know, the, the CAS facility that uh, takes in uh, kind of the, the, the hardcore uh, homeless folks, you know, uh, is, is, is in Phoenix and, and I'm grateful to them for, for shouldering a lot of that. Uh, Mesa is a close second when it comes to providing uh, homeless services. You know, we, we've got the East Valley Men's Shelter and, and a lot of great uh, nonprofits in the city of Mesa that are, you know, Paz de Cristo and St. Vincent de Paul and, and Save the Family and others that are just uh, you know, really doing God's work, you know, helping uh, folks that are down on their luck. Uh, so th this was an issue, you know, long before COVID uh, showed up in Mesa that we've been trying to, to get better at. Um, at. And then when COVID comes, that, that complicates things because you've got an at-risk population that we don't want, you know, to get sick and to, and to it, it's kind of very fertile territory, you know, for, 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 for that population to, to really be impacted by COVID. Uh, and so we've been using some of the COVID mon money that I told you about earlier uh, as part of this operation off the streets program to, uh, to, to help those people that are particularly at risk. Uh, and uh, so we, uh, we don't want people urban camping in the city of Mesa. We want them, you know, spending the night someplace other than in our parks and, and in our alleys and, and uh, on the railroad tracks. So uh, we have a, uh, you know, the hospitality industry during this downturn has been decimated. So, you know, hotels and motels literally are 
just just shutting down, you know, because it, 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 it's, they can't keep the doors open. Uh, and so uh, we have been uh, trying to kill two birds with one stone here. And, and for, the, uh, for the last few months, you know, we've been uh, renting up to 85 motel rooms a night. Uh, and uh, we have uh, navigators who uh, is what they're called that work for community bridges. That, so it, it's not just, hey, you're, you're homeless, come and spend the night in a motel. It's, hey, do, will you uh, accept uh, help? You know, will you be, uh, accept wraparound services? Will you, you know, become a part of the system? Uh, and so the, the folks that we've been extending these uh, hotel room nights to, they're also getting uh, assistance. You know, it, it, it's part of a plan to get them off the street. It's not, it, it's more than a bed. Um, it, it's, uh, it's getting them enrolled in programs. So, uh, the silver lining, you know, to the to the COVID uh, storm has been that we've been able to it, it uh, it's facilitated us really getting to know our homeless population a little better and and and, uh, and having uh, a way to connect to them to get them off the street and get them more involved in in getting assistance. Thank you. So I know we have just a few minutes left um, and I, there are two topics that have come up that I thought maybe I would to see if you could touch on briefly. One is uh, the Education Promise Program rolling out in 2021 and the other is Mesa becoming a dementia free city. Uh, and I thought maybe you might want to talk to each of those. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, one of the, our ongoing priorities as a community, uh, second to you know, protecting the health and safety of our community uh, during the COVID crisis, I, I would say that you know, we still are, are maintaining our, our uh, making a priority, trying to improve the education attainment of our community. Uh, and, and so that means we want more kids in preschool, but it also means, and, and the city plays a role in that through our Mesa K Ready program, but it also means that we want we, uh, we have a goal as part of this Arizona Achieve 60 goal to, to have at least two years of post high school education, you know, for, for kids coming out of high school uh, in Mesa. Uh, and, and a great uh, tool to use to achieve that goal is Mesa Community College. You know, uh, uh, we would love it if, if kids and, and also EBIT, you know, there's other programs. We're not necessarily saying that everyone ought to, that the answer for everyone is to, to pursue a four-year, you know, college diploma, it's not. You know, there's a lot of people that will be far more successful financially, you know, if, if they uh, take advantage of some of the other great programs that are out there for, for post high school uh, training. So uh, in order, so uh, we've announced what's called the Mesa College Promise Program. And, and what that is, is if uh, you're a high, um, if you graduate from a Mesa high school uh, and you can, jump through a few hoops, you know, you have to take the FAFSA uh, application to find out, you know, what uh, you might be eligible for uh, as far as grants and, and, and things like that from the federal government. But if, if you'll do that, and if you're eligible uh, for, for those, uh, for that financial assistance, we'll make up the difference uh, to get you enrolled at Mace Community College for two years. Uh, you know, uh, so, and it, it's, it's a wonderful, uh, idea that's been very successful in other parts of the United States uh, and uh, it's something that we can do. So but between uh, and the, the city of Mesa is, is uh, very much a partner in this and, and we're contributing uh, some, some money to this program but uh, equally uh, important is the, the support of the business community because uh, we, we're trying to raise as much money that, uh, from philanthropy as the city is contributing for this to be successful. And uh, I, I've been involved in that fundraising and it's going very, very well. Uh, we, we're, we're going to be announcing some very generous uh, contributions from some of the large corporations in the city of Mesa. Uh, and, and this is an idea that, that needs to really be uh, established and, and be long lasting and be the new normal in the city of Mesa. We want it to, to be self-sustaining and to have a, to be a foundation that, you know, doesn't go away when those of us that are excited about this idea, you know, uh, aren't uh, uh, in office anymore. So, uh, but I, I, again, we've, we've already got, it's, it, it's starting uh, a year from now, you know, next fall. So the, the kids that are high school seniors right now, we're telling them, you know, hey, apply for the Mesa College Promise Program and we'll make sure that you can uh, get, get uh, in and out of Mesa, uh, Mesa Community College. You know, money won't be an excuse. Uh, so 
I'm very excited about it and would appreciate everyone uh, helping to get the word out. And, and if this is an issue that you're passionate about, we'd, we'd love to have you be a, a part of it as well. Uh, Bob, what was the other issue we were talking about? We have dementia. <laughs> <laughs> the, other, the other day- Well Sally played, sent me a, sir. Well played. <laughs> that was totally uh, not, not a calculated uh, setup. The other day, Sally sent me a message about, hey, do you remember when I was talking to you about dementia? And I just thought that was so funny. You know, I, how could I <laughs> dare say no? I don't remember you asking me about dementia. <clears throat> but um, last night at our city council meeting, we issued a proclamation um, uh, kind of jo joining uh, Mesa to be a dementia uh, friendly uh, city and uh, having a partnership you know, with the chamber and with uh, uh, um, the, the providers, the nonprofits in our community uh, to, to, to be more supportive of uh, families and individuals that, uh, that are confronted with dementia. So uh, it, 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 this is modeled somewhat after you know, the, the uh, initiative that we've been going with for the last year or so on, on being an autism friendly community. Uh, that's paid some, some great dividends. I mean, I've had lots of, you know, national reporters, you know, call me and tell me, uh, ask me questions about this uh, autism friendly uh, certification that we've got. And we want to do the same thing with the uh, dementia friendly uh, uh, program as well. So I think it's, it's, it's raising awareness. Uh, it's, um, like I said, part of this, uh, disconnected seniors issue that we started out this conversation with. You know, there, there's, a, there's a tremendous need out there for uh, supporting members of our community that are struggling with dementia and families that, that need assistance, uh, need some respite care and need some community support. So uh, I'm, I'm excited to be a part of it. And, and coincidentally, it was just last night that we issued that proclamation and, and we're looking forward to, uh, to working with the providers in, in the city to partner with them. Cool. So um, I know you're probably pressed for time, so I don't necessarily want to keep you any longer than we have to. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pass this back over to Sally to kind of wrap up and, uh, and thank you for being with us today. My pleasure. It's been fun to be with you. Mayor, it's always good to see you. And I know that our businesses appreciate all that you do. Um, we'll find another time to do another Java. Obviously, there's always new things going on. So we want to bring you back so you can give more updates. But thank you again for last night. Um, I know that the dementia friendly um, cities is important to our community. We do have in, um, you know, in some of our areas an older population and we do have a lot of our members that work with um, the aging population, so it means a lot. And we will be doing ongoing training um, for anybody and everybody who wants to um, either personally get trained or have their, their you know, staff um, get on the, the calls and get trained. So um, with that, Mayor, unless you have anything else, we'll go ahead and end the call. It's 9.01 and um, congratulations again. We appreciate you. you and all you do for Mesa. Anybody thank else? You. Stephen Felicia, thank, thank you very much for sponsoring this morning. Thanks to the chamber for being such a, a great part of our community and, and getting no, engaged just, in these issues. We just want to really you. thank Mayor Giles because we really miss Java with Giles. We liked having that chance to see what's going on and we love you and we think you're doing a great job. So we appreciate <laughs> it. Thank you. Likewise. You're not alone, Mayor. Thank you All right. Much. With that, everybody have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. bye.